really a great privilege to be here to share with you today a little bit of an introduction, sorry, an introduction on the research process. And I hope this will help provide a little context for what you're going to be hearing in the next uh, two days. Um, I'm extremely thankful to the NCCA for making this meeting possible and for the esteemed uh, speakers that you're going to be hearing from. I became a neuroblastoma mom 23 years ago, and my son was diagnosed at six years old in 1991. He um, unfortunately relapsed when he was 20 years old, when he was in college, and he went through multiple therapies and died in 2010. And I was just having an interesting discussion last night. There may be a genetic um, mutation that causes such an unusual late relapse, but um, the hope is that, um, that this is going to become more and more rare as time goes on. Uh, my background is I have a chemical engineering degree, which doesn't help terribly at all with anything to do with medical uh, issues. It's just I'm not very intimidated to look up new words, <laughs> find out what they mean. So I've been doing really little else for the past 10 years, but reading about neuroblastoma. And um, I do work for Solving Kids Cancer, as um, Mark mentioned. I'm an FDA uh, patient representative, and I'm on the NAN, uh, Parent Advisory Council. That's the New Approaches to Neuroblastoma Therapy Research Consortium. And there's a new uh, collaboration that's formed over the past couple of years in the United States. There's about 200 pediatric cancer charities, and we've kind of come together in a coalition called uh, Coalition Against Childhood Cancer. And it's called, uh, the nickname is CAC2, and I'm on the board of that, and it's exciting because that's hopefully going to foster more uh, collaboration with charities. And together, as Bettina mentioned, uh, we've formed an, uh, an international alliance called Embrace in order to fund uh, international clinical trials. And I have to make a, a special um, call out to Pat Tulungan, who has been doing parent conferences for 15 years. And um, because of her uh, work in doing this, she's really um, created a new day, I think, for parent education and families. And she was helpful, um, I think it was two years ago, to do the first parent meeting here. So I think this quote um, is, is perfect for the premise of this meeting. Knowledge is of two kinds. We can know a subject ourselves, or we can know where to find information on it. And if we have knowledge, we can know our options. And if we know our options, we can make informed decisions. And this is the basis of informed consent. But as we all know, even with the best information, there are no guarantees. And you are very familiar with the answer to the question of what is neuroblastoma, so I want to give you just some quick history points. Um, it, Er, two Germans and two Americans got early recognition for describing this disease, which was named in 1910. It's amazing to think it was uh, over 100 years ago. And Audrey Evans in 1971 was the first one to develop a staging system, and you're going to be hearing more about her later. And then Garrett Broder's group was the first to uh, realize the significance of NMIC amplification in the 80s. And during the 80s is when uh, work on MIBG was happening, antibodies uh, was being developed, and bone marrow transplant was being explored, and early work in genetics. And what is amazing at this meeting, you're going to hear from some of the rock stars involved in these important um, uh, advances. One of them is Kate Mathay, who had the very first uh, pediatric clinical trial that was on the cover of the New England Journal of Medicine. That was in 1999. Um, that was showing the benefit of transplant and cisretinic acid. Then 10 years later, LSU was the star of ASCO. That's an association of uh, Society of Clinical, American Society of Clinical Oncology. And when you think about 30,000 oncologists meeting, uh, oncologists and scientists, and neuroblastoma is 7% of 1% of all cancers. To be the lead story at a, a meeting like that is pretty exciting. After her article appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010, there were 200 news stories within the next two days, and 3,000 blogs reported on the story. So it's pretty big news. And then, of course, we have Dr. Maris, and he has led the effort to understand and characterize the genomics of neuroblastoma. So, as you know, it's a very heterogeneous disease. 
Um, because of the work to describe this, we see that it's, it's, you could categorize it as the very best and the very worst. I mean, it's a disease that can spontaneously regress and yet in, a, in the worst forms be very difficult to cure. So you have about 37% are low risk and 18% are intermediate risk and those have fairly good survival rates. But the high risk, which represents about 45%, still have a very, uh, uh, unacceptable uh, survival rate. So Andy Pearson and Sue Cohn and uh, 50 other neuroblastoma experts started meeting in 2004 to define the INRG, which is the International Neuroblastoma Risk Group, and staging systems. The reason why this is important is, as we'll see later, when we try to look at survival curves and, and analyze uh, clinical trials, if you're not talking about the same patient groups, it's impossible to compare them. So, and we'll take a quick look at how research is conducted. Um, the first step to testing cancer drugs is in preclinical work. This is where the um, neuroblastoma cell lines will be in, in petri dishes and in, then eventually in mice, and drugs are tested against them. Only about 5% of the drugs that are tested preclinically ever get into a phase one clinical trial. A phase one clinical trial, the point is to test for dose and toxicity. Um, so the, the dose is usually escalated and uh, toxicities are noted. These are usually smaller trials, so sometimes 10 to 30 are included in phase one trials if it's a single disease. And then if there's um, provocative information from that, then a phase two trial may be planned. The idea is to look for efficacy in relapse patients. Those are a little bit bigger usually between 30 and 60, roughly. And then if there is a, a signal from that, the, those um, drugs or agents or combinations or interventions may be rolled into a phase three trial, which is f usually for after, um, in frontline therapy. And then those are randomized to the standard treatment to see if, there's, um, if the intervention is better. In the case of the chimeric 1418 antibody, this process took 25 years. So to um, see how we find out about the research, the, the research is planned and the trials conducted, the data is analyzed, and then usually, the, um, not always, but uh, often, the, the results are gonna be released at a meeting and then within a, a few years, the resor results are published. The frustrating thing is not all clinical trials are published, so um, you don't always know what happened unless you talk to the investigator. So for the large clinical trials, as you know, there's a small number of uh, neuroblastoma patients, so large study groups conduct the uh, phase three trials. And so the primary um, sources of those are the COG, the SIOP, and the GPOH in Germany. So how do we learn about research as parents? Well, the idea is to look for um, scientifically sound sources, and those are usually peer-reviewed journals. So if you're looking for um, clinical trials, you can look on the NIH listing. This is not comprehensive. There are many trials that are not listed on here, but it's probably the most comprehensive list. The NCI has a, a separate list as well. Um, you can look in PubMed for um, published journals. If you um, do a search on neuroblastoma, over 30,000 abstracts will show up but only about 700, if you reduce the search to clinical trials, is about 700. So that means only 2% of all the published information on neuroblastoma is referring to clinical trials. The rest of it is preclinical and other uh, basic science questions. So what about unpublished information? You could go to meetings and see early presentations of work. Uh, there are lots and lots and lots of meetings. As I mentioned, ASCO is pretty big. Usually 30,000 attend that. Another big one for preclinical primarily uh, is AACR, and then anywhere from 15 to 17,000 will attend those. And then uh, uh, many other meetings exist, but that's a good way to find out what's happening uh, real time. So to give you a little perspective, in 1991 when I first heard about neuroblastoma, there was no internet. <coughs> So I didn't know anything except for what my doctor handed me at the hospital. In 1997, PubMed was launched, and today, in 2014, we have too much information. Interesting, um, similar to the genomic data that's being uh, collected. What do we do with all this data? So the, the question is, 
why is there such an interest in neuroblastoma? I thought this was an interesting thing to compare. If you look at the incidence of neuroblastoma and the number of publications in one year versus rhabdomyosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma, look at, there's almost twice the publications per incidence um, for neuroblastoma. So it's an interesting tumor. And we, by the way, have the best and the brightest studying this disease. So parents have a new problem, though, with all of this information. Uh, we have to be able to discern good versus bad information. And so I want to run over a couple of quick items that you, you might want to look at when you're looking at um, journal articles. It's, it's a good idea to look at the journal. Does it have a high impact factor, which means that it's often, it's heavily cited journal. So in other words, it's respected within the, uh, the research community. Um, what about the institution? Do they have a, a good reputation? And does the author have a lot of experience with neuroblastoma? When you're looking at the medical statistics, you know, the significance is a huge issue. When I first started reading things, I get all excited about an abstract that had six patients. In it. It's like, I, I, you know, it took time to realize that really doesn't have any significance. And so you have to look at that and then the patient characteristics that are described in the um, statistics. So now what I want to look at, um, just for comparison, and I wasn't sure if you could see this very well. Um, this was just published a few months ago. And it's the outcome for children with metastatic solid tumors. And we use this as an example for why you need to know the patient characteristics. Notice neuroblastoma looks pretty good. It looks like about 50% on the top line. So this is decades. It's divided by decades. So neuroblastoma is the upper right corner. And Wilms tumor is down here. Now this is metastatic Wilms tumor, not uh, uh, isolated Wilms tumor. And then you look at Ewing's sar uh, osteosarcoma and rhabdomyosarcoma, they look a lot worse than neuroblastoma. But remember who's included in that neuroblastoma graph. Intermediate risk can be metastatic, and as well as some low risk. So that, um, that line is elevated because it includes all metastatic neuroblastomas. So this is an example to tease out. But the other issue is to see, to understand that other metastatic solid tumors are pretty bad. So this is another graph that shows high risk as opposed to metastatic. And this was from a few years ago, um, but shows five-year um, survival curves. One of the interesting things to note is, is a graph flat? at any point, that's, that's an important consideration because that means there aren't late events. And also the fact that we do see a significant increase in survival. In 10 years time, um, the survival rate has, has doubled. So that's, that's pretty significant. Okay, so another issue to look at when you're looking at survival graphs is the starting points. When you look at these two graphs, they look the same, except for um, they're both event-free survival. They both have 60% um, that are event free at 10 months. But the difference between is on the left, it's months from diagnosis, and on the right, it's months from transplant or high dose chemo. This is important when you're looking at the um, different survival curves, especially if you're comparing COG and PSYOP. Oh, you need to know what is the starting point. And here's an exa a math example of why this is so important. If you started with 100 patients and they all went through induction, but only 50% had a complete response or a very good partial response. The reason why I put PR question mark in there is because some, uh, some trials have had partial response go to transplant. But in this case, let's say only 50% get a CR and a VGPR. So that means 50% of the kids just dropped off that study. So now only 50 go to transplant, and let's say there's a 5% transplant uh, related or treatment related mortality. It's actually less than that now, but some studies have had this high as that. And now only 48 are gonna go on to maintenance therapy with antibodies. And let's say 60% are event free um, in that case. The overall number is 29. So now you're looking at a 29% survival out of the original 100. So if you graphed any of those with different starting points, you can see uh, why those graphs look so different. And this is revealed in this, uh, these two, uh, survival graphs. You can see uh, this is from the 3891 that compared bone marrow transplant to no transplant and cis-retinoic acid to no um, biologic. And you can see in here on the left, uh, you have the time since the first randomization. And then on the right, you have the time since the second randomization. So you can see why those curves look so different. 
All right, so now I want to cover a little bit of where our frontline therapies have come from, the history of the of the frontline trials. So in recent history, the effort has been to lower the intensity of low and intermediate risk and um, intensify therapy for high risk. And so as you all know, the standard of care for high risk neuroblastoma is um, induction with several cycles of chemotherapy, then you have stem cell transplant and radiation, and then you have some post-consolidation or maintenance therapy, which is um, usually cisretinoic acid and antibodies. So uh, one question that a lot of parents um, struggle with is why these have to be randomized. So there's a key principle in bioethics, especially with doing human research and, and including children, is that um, there has to be equipoise that is present in those, uh, those, the design of those studies, which means that the, the planners and the, those who are conducting the trial do not believe for sure that one arm is better than the other. And so, of course, there has to be an evidence base, too, for introducing the new intervention. The truth is these um, treatments are so complex, you can't randomize everything, so those are carefully chosen. And as you know, they're very expensive and uh, very time consuming. So equipoise the, is, um, it, actually this paper was just published uh, actually a couple weeks ago. I thought this was interesting. Um, it's, it was from a group at SickKids and their conclusion about the equipoise that they've observed in pediatric drug trials is that they said the concept of equipoise is not widely incorporated in pediatric research and a major change in climate will be needed to ensure that children are, expo are not exposed to the risk of an inferior or placebo option of therapy when a better option has been proven. So they explored um, the various trials that had been done. Not, they weren't cancer trials, there were other indications as well, but that was an interesting um, the conclusion that they came to, that it's still a debate when equipoise is present in the designs of these. And obviously the stakeholders have different views on randomization. Um, the patients and their families want the best therapy, whatever that is. The physician that treats that individual child wants the best therapy. Um, scientists, though, have to answer the question robustly. And the same thing for the biotech and the pharma that is looking for um, approval for their drug. They need to have good evidence um, that this actually works. So here's an example of a negative trial. Um, in, between 2000 and 2006, there were 489 children randomized to having their stem cells purged versus not purged for stem cells. Now, it sounds like a really good idea to purge the cells. They were below detection levels, but half of the, so if anyone had detectable um, neuroblastoma in their stem cells, it wasn't used. And that there was very few. But the point is, is that they're gonna remove uh, what they theorize would be uh, tiny bits of neuroblastoma in the stem cells. So after doing this trial for six years and almost 500 children, you could see there was no difference between those. So even though it seemed like a very good idea, it was an important randomization to do because it's an expensive process and it wastes a lot of stem cells. So, and here's the another graph showing that, that um, it wasn't effective. So you can see that, um, and there are other trials that have done the same thing. Now this is a very busy slide. I really, I really like this slide. It has a lot of information on it. And I understand what it means because I made the slide. Um, <laughs> but what I want you to point out it is first of all, there's a lot of trials. The top row has all the European phase three trials, and the bottom row has the, um, the trials that have been done in the US. The bolded ones are answers to randomization. So the high dose was shown to be a, uh, an, a benefit in the first trial. The 10 day cycle versus the 21 day was shown to be a benefit in the second one. Um, bone marrow transplant again verified in the uh, 3891 and then the Germans did a high dose of versus uh, continuation chemotherapy and it also showed a benefit and so then you see the US the one we just talked about with the purge versus no purge and then LSU's study with the chimeric antibody and cytokines showed an advantage then in SIOP, they showed um, so far that GCSF between cycles of chemotherapy is a benefit, and they showed that Bumel is a better transplant regimen than CEM. 
So now we have uh, several upcoming trials that are going to uh, show us hopefully more information. Uh, one of those is the German trial that is randomizing topotecan uh, in upfront chemotherapy. That's supposed to finish uh, fairly soon. And then the COG has finished accruing on the single versus tandem uh, transplant, but the results won't be released um, probably until next year. Now the SIOP is continuing the trial. Um, it, the rapid COJEC is now going to be randomized again against a modified N7 induction. And then another randomization has just been added with long-term infusion of chimeric antibody with or without a half dose of subcutaneous IL-2. And then the next COG um, trial will be uh, um, possibly opening next year. So that kind of gives you a smattering of what's been done. And now the question is, how have these answers affected the future trials? Well, um, I'm going to skip that one because that question is still being asked. But obviously, this trial, the, the COG trial, has answered the question that uh, antibodies seem to be very helpful. So that's going to be part of standard therapy in, in places that can do that. In, uh, at ASCO this past year, uh, Ruth Ladenstein presented um, early results on, on the chimeric antibody with the subcutaneous IL-2 that was randomized. Sorry, can't see anything on that. But um, by the way, this slide is on the, up here on a website. So if you want to see that, you can look at that in more detail. It's, it's actually a very interesting slide. But this is the a zoom in of her results with the chimeric antibody with and without the IL-2. Um, as you can see in here, there's no difference between those two. So that's why they're redoing, uh, looking at that question with long-term infusion of chimeric antibody and half dose of IL-2 because they thought the toxicity of that arm was too much. So that covers uh, frontline therapies. What about relapse? The goal of relapse therapies in, in a pure um, scientific view is to See for, look for activity in new agents. We want to see if it works against neuroblastoma. And then eventually those could be considered for rolling into frontline to prevent them from ever relapsing. If you look on the NIH listing, there are, are always over 100 neuroblastoma trials, but only about half of them have any um, application for relapse or refractory disease. Um, there's many ideas out there on what to do with relapse, and that includes combining new drugs, um, personalized medicine or precision medicine, MIBG com combinations, uh, targeted radiation with other agents, uh, various immunotherapies, including um, antibody combinations, oncolytic viruses, vaccines, engineered T cells, NK cells, and then various transplant um, approaches. These are um, widespread and uh, there's a lot of activity going on and what is interesting to me because I, I look at what's going on in osteo and some of the sarcomas as well is there's so many more trials for neuroblastoma than some of those other diseases and they have you know they have as the same number order of magnitude of patients um, so one of the biggest challenges I think for um, doctors who have to treat children who are relapsed is really considering a rational uh, therapy and a rational approach. It's very difficult to figure out what to do. And because when all the children are treated differently, you, you can't uh, collect data on what is a meaningful, rational uh, regimen. So this, there's a lot of work going on in that area, and it's, I think that's very important. Okay, and then lastly, uh, very quickly, I'm going to go over what is, the, uh, what is research advocacy. This is a, a term that's been, I think, at least in my life, it's been recently coined. A lot of people think it's uh, patient advocacy or it's you know going to Washington DC and saying, give us more money. It's actually not either one of those. Uh, research advocacy is when the patient community it sits down and talks with the scientific community about what's, what's happening. How is this trial gonna run? Parents want the best clinical trial design and researchers need money and, and patients to do their trials. So it creates a dialogue, an opportunity. And charities that are um, driven by parents can deliver patient-focused funding for research. Now, the aptitude for this kind of activity requires a interest in basic science and clinical research and regulatory processes. And some interesting examples of this are what happened with the HIV advocates. A lot of people think, oh, those were people marching in the streets. Well, in the 80s, and this, again, pre-internet, 
Um, they learned the science. They sat down with uh, um, researchers at the NIH and said, we have ideas. And they, you know, really put forth the effort to learn what they needed to know, and they, they affected the research agenda and really set a course for other disease areas. And breast cancer is a huge uh, model of research advocacy. They have a boot camp that takes only the best and the brightest. And when I was at ASCO, there were 350 advocates there. There were only two pediatric cancer advocates. And I met a woman who had a PhD in biomedical engineering, and she had a hard time getting into their boot camp, their research advocacy boot camp. She was very, very bright and was, you know, looking for meaningful um, drugs and, and trying to make connections with clinicians. And it was, a, it was fascinating hearing her uh, story on uh, what was doing. But this isn't very common in pediatric cancer. And part of the problem is because we have very few patients, and there's 12 major subtypes of pediatric cancer. So it's hard to be um, well versed in, in all of those. So I'd like to end with uh, a thought I had last night when I wasn't sleeping. And it was about um, this idea of, you know, in the psychosocial research that's done on pediatric cancer, they talk about post-traumatic stress and how are families impacted by the cancer thing. And I was thinking about, you know, there's been some encouraging stuff that comes out on post-traumatic growth. And I thought, you know, that defines all, a lot of the people. I see evidence of that around me when I'm with, in a room with cancer families, is there's a lot of evidence of post-traumatic growth. And I, and I was thinking about how our community, which like Chris Riddle in the video said, it was perfect. It's our community shouldn't be this big, but it is what it is, but it's an also very um, intense environment, it's an intense community, and we really depend on each other. I was thinking about the parallel, where my grandfather was a, in, he was in World War II, and he was shot down over Germany, he was doing bombing raids, so he spent a year in a prisoner of war camp, and he did not talk about it for 50 years. And then he found some friends, and they formed an organization, was an XPOW organization, and so he finally started talking about it and started, um, you know, sharing. So he had that shared experience, and this little group of little old people took care of each other till they all died one by one. So I was just thinking about how that community really affected his life and how this community has affected mine. So anyway, I just want to thank you all for being here, and I just appreciate it very much.